gospel this morning is found in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. This will also serve as today's sermon text. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we have to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Good morning. How are you? I have your bag filled with water. Who wants me to open it over? No one? I also have a skewer. I'm going to poke this. What do you think, water? What do you think is going to happen when I do that? The water's going to come out. Huh? The water's going to come out. The water's going to come out? Think so? I don't know. Well, this worked for me, and I practiced it, but I have a bowl just in case. It's my anticipating that it won't come out, but we'll find out. water coming up. It's staying in. Now what would happen if I take the skewer out? Why? Why would now water come out once the skewer? There's nothing plugging it in anymore. The skewer has just replaced the plastic that was there. But if I take that out, water's going to come gushing out. The reason why I did this, other than this is kind of cool to look at, um, is that this is an illustration of how much we depend on Jesus. For our lives and, and for our salvation, we need Jesus all the way. If you take Jesus out, then our lives and our salvation will drain out of our lives. They'll be gone. We might be able to live a long life without Jesus, but we won't have salvation. We won't have heaven. We are completely dependent on God, just like we are like just like this water is completely dependent on this skewer staying in there now so that the water doesn't come out. So then the question is, if we are completely dependent on God, can we be dependent on him? Does he keep all his promises? Does he always come through for you? He absolutely does. He always comes through. He always does what he says he's going to do, which means... He's forgiven you, which means you're his children. He loves you, he cares about you, and he has won heaven for you. And you can rely on that and hold on to that and be certain, just as certain as this water isn't coming out right now, your salvation is secure because Jesus is the one who's holding you together. And he is completely dependable, so we can completely depend on him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us every reason to trust in you. Thank you for showing us that when we rely solely on you, we can be 100% confident that we will be saved, that we will be going to heaven. Thank you for such confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are all dependent. <coughs> At one time in our life, we were completely dependent on our parents to care for us. From the time we were in our mother's womb to that time when we came out, when that time we were growing, we relied on our parents or those who were caring for us to give us everything that we needed because we couldn't survive on our own. But even if you've moved out or you have been independent of your parents for some time, you're still dependent. You still need others. You still need others to do the job that they're hired to do. You still need people to help you make sure that you can have the things that you have. No one is completely independent. Even the most independent person needs other people to help them achieve their independence. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us when God tells us that we are dependent when it comes to our salvation. That we can't say and take all the credit for it. Now, where we might raise an eyebrow, where we might get maybe a little uncomfortable, or maybe even start fighting a little bit, at least naturally, is when God tells us that we are completely dependent on Him. And that is because even though we are dependent on others in, this, in our lifetime, generally speaking, with everything, whether or not it's our job, or how well we're doing in life, or even our health, we usually have to play a role. We have to do something. I mean, we can't be healthy unless we do what is required to be healthy. We can't have good finances unless we do the work that is required or have the job that is required or the education that is required. We can't be good at a certain sport unless we put in the work. And we can't be good at any kind of task for that matter without trying and working and practicing. Well, the point is, we always end up having to do something. So when God then says, well, everything, when it comes to salvation, you have nothing to take credit for, nothing to pat your back on, nothing that says, yes, this is where I have earned my salvation. This is where, this is the part I play. It might cause us to maybe fight back. A little bit, at least naturally, our sinful nature hates hearing that it can't do anything right when it comes to our salvation. Well, we're not the first ones to be fighting against that thought. So often we see this throughout life with other people, but we also see it in Jesus' day, and even long before that, people looking to themselves for any kind of possibility that this is why I'm saved, looking for any amount of credit. And Jesus encountered someone who had that same philosophy, that same idea of how one was saved. And so we get to see how Jesus addressed this man, how he handled this man, as he answered that very important question, the question we all need to know the answer to. What must I do to be saved? Before we even get to that section where Jesus says that, what's going on in Luke chapter 18 kind of just following this common theme. Jesus started off this chapter by saying, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And then he proceeds to show us the, time, the kind of faith God is talking about. What kind of faith is God looking for? What is that? Is he wondering, will it be here when I get back? And so first, Luke takes us to the, to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And we see that it was the tax collector who had the faith that Jesus was looking for, and not the religious Pharisee. And then after that, he takes us to the account where people were bringing little babies to Jesus to have him bless them. But many people were trying to stop these parents from coming. And Jesus points out that the faith he's looking for was found in those little children, the little babies that were being brought, not in the adults that were trying to prevent them. So when God is looking for faith, what is he looking for? He's looking for faith that's completely dependent on him. No one would look at the tax collector and say, yes, you're the one who earned your salvation, not in Jesus' day. And yet, 
He's the one who had the faith. He was the one who was saved. And when we look at little babies, we look at them, but we don't see any proof that they're saved. We don't see them confess their sins. And that's why it's led many to even believe that they can't be, that they're automatically saved, that they can't even do any wrong and tell, well, they can reason, but God has, a, has other ideas and other truth. And he shows us that, yes, they absolutely believe. But the only way a baby would believe is if God gave them that faith. They wouldn't have earned it. They wouldn't have deserved it. Complete dependence on God for everything. And then we get to our section. We have a, we have a ruler. We don't know what kind of ruler. Some speculate he might have been another religious leader or he could have been a government official. Either way, he went to Jesus, this good teacher, as he called him, for advice. He wanted to know if there was anything else that needed to be done in order for him to be saved. So he asked that all-important question, what must I do to be saved? Am I missing anything? Am I lacking anything? For I have done pretty good, at least that's his opinion, and more than likely he was probably a very upright guy, someone that you would have wanted to be around or looked up to. But he wanted to know more, so he goes to Jesus. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? He still needed to learn how the vital, the vital truth that he can't do anything. This man thought, if I, whatever Jesus tells me that I'm lacking, I'm sure I can just do that, work hard at that, and I will achieve my salvation. He just wanted to be what many people would refer as just be a good Christian, and you will be okay. Well, Jesus wants him to stop thinking that way. He wants to get him off that pursuit and start realizing that he can't look at anything he's ever done as his reason to be saved. And to start off, Jesus names off a bunch of commands, and he's not trying to be exhaustive. He doesn't want to name all of them, but he names a good handful of them for the main purpose of what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to remind us that we are failures, that we have failed in every way. We haven't obeyed any of the commands, and so naming them off is just a reminder that we haven't done it. But this man doesn't catch the hint. He still thinks, no, nope, I've kept these since I was a youth, he says. I've been really good. I've honored my parents. I haven't murdered, committed adultery, stolen, or even lied about anyone. I'm a good person. So Jesus has to go deeper. And he uses the law again like a scalpel, cutting right to the heart. And he says, one thing you lack. Sell everything you own and follow me. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And that's where he exposed him. And no, this isn't, a te this isn't where we prove that we all better sell our, all our possessions and give them to the poor. That's not what's being done here. What's being done is Jesus is showing him that he is not perfect. In fact, he's failed. In fact, he hasn't even gone past the first commandment. For this man loved his wealth more than he loved God. And therefore he's a lawbreaker. And therefore he's a failure. And therefore he's not as saved as he thought. So often we would agree with Jesus and say, yes, I am blessed by God. God has given me everything. He's even given me my salvation. We, we're all here. We're not here to argue the fact that Jesus is our Savior, that if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be going to heaven. We gladly give him all the credit, and that's good. And yet, how often do, do our actions betray our words? How often do we act like that's not what we're dependent on for our salvation. How often do we act like we're dependent on something else, something we've done, or something we have for the proof that we are saved and not the declaration that it is finished? We show it a lot. We often fail. 
We show it in how we even give our offerings sometimes. When we think about the money we have, it's so easy for us to say, well, I'm doing well financially. That shows that God loves me, God cares about me. And while that is a blessing from God and definitely shows that he loves you, that's not why you're going to heaven. That's not proof you're going to heaven, that your life's going well. But if that's how you think of it, well, then how are you going to give? You're going to give in a way that's not as generous as God wants it to be. God wants you to give with a cheerful heart, but he also wants you to give un uncomfortably. In other words, give in such a way that you need to really trust that God's going to take care of you, even though you're giving more than maybe you're comfortable with. Trusting that God's going to still be there. He's still going to provide your daily bread, even though you can't have exactly everything that you want. But if you see your salvation based on how well your life is, well, you're not going to give. You're going to hold back. You're going to not be as generous with your things, with your time, with your talents. We also see it in the way that we think. Oftentimes, we don't think we even need to give up certain things. Maybe our schedule conflicts with our time with God. But we might have this idea, well, you know, I go to church enough. I go to Bible study enough. I read my Bible enough that I can afford to take breaks. I can afford to be away. I can afford to not listen to God. I can afford to just not be as dedicated as I, can, as I usually am. And while it's true, you miss a Sunday, you miss a Bible class, you miss that five minutes or ten minutes, however long it takes for you to have your personal time with God. You're not going to lose your faith in that moment. But what does it say about us when we're even willing to mess with it? When we're even willing to risk it? When we're even willing not to find a way to replace that moment that we missed? If we miss church, fine, but what are you going to replace it with? Do we even consider that all the time? And sometimes we don't. And we also, just in general, with our actions, with our words, we don't often talk about how important it is to be at God's feet. And that's because we have this idea that my church attendance means I'm going to heaven, my good works mean I'm going to heaven, or whatever else we look at. And God needs us to stop doing that. He needs us to stop Counting our attendance, counting our works, counting our actions, our thoughts. Because they don't matter when it comes to why you are saved. That's not why you're saved. Because you're here today is not why you are saved. You're saved for a completely different reason, and it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with our God. Because it's absolutely impossible for us to save ourselves. Because we also have failed. We haven't been perfect. We haven't lived up to God's standards. We haven't even gone past the first commandment. For we have placed idols in our hearts or have not put God first all the time. And so like the rich man, we have failed. The whole point that Jesus was making when he says that the eye of the needle, camel through the eye of the needle, is just to remind us how impossible it is to be saved. A lot of people think that God was trying to make a different kind of point. He isn't. Imagine if someone said that a camel could walk through that little hole of the needle. You would just laugh at him because you know it's impossible. It's not even a consideration. Well, so is us thinking any one of our works has saved us. It's that impossible. It's not even worth considering. The rich man went away sad, and we don't know what happened to him later. I certainly hope he turned around and came back and heard more from Jesus, because Jesus had more to say. The disciples proved that, for the disciples realized what Jesus was saying and said, well then, who can be saved if we can't even take any credit for it? If we can't earn any of it, then how is it possible that anyone is saved? And good news, Jesus was quick and eager to answer that question. What is impossible with mankind is not is, is possible with him. We can't do it. 
But you know who can? Our God. And he didn't sit idly by. But let's think about how what Jesus had to do in order to make sure that we were saved. He had to first be born of a human being because it was humans who messed up. So a human had to take our place. But he has to remain sinless. So he has to make sure that he doesn't take on Mary's sin, which he does. And then he has to continue on being perfect. And this is while living in this world, this world full of temptation and evil and the devil's attacks. And they gave him their best. And Jesus won. He stayed perfect through it all. But then he had to put on himself all of our sins. Not just all of my sins, but all of your sins, and all of the world's sins, and all of those sins that still haven't even been committed by us yet had to be on him. And all the sins that have been committed, and people who haven't even been born, their sins. He had to carry all of them all at once and go to hell. And not, and not do it imperfectly. And then after he died, which, by the way, is impossible with God, and so he had to make it possible for him to die, and to even separate himself from himself, for God the Father turned his back on the Son, the Trinity, so interconnected, separated themselves for a moment, did after all of that, he had to rise again, take his life back. If that was laid out for any one of us, would there even be a consideration that we could be saved? If he said, this is what you must do to be saved, we would say, well, I'm not saved. Not even happy. Not even close. I'm not even going to give it a try because I can't do it. But Jesus did it. He did all of it. He did every single thing. He made the impossible possible by doing it himself. And because he did it all, we can be certain that we are saved. And because Jesus did it all, this is why we want to be connected to him. This is why church attendance and Bible study attendance and reading our Bibles at home is important and why we want to continuously do it. Because it keeps us connected to Him and the salvation that He won. It's not why we're going to heaven. We do it because we're going to heaven. We don't want to risk being separated from our God because we know that only through him we're going to heaven, where only through him our sins are forgiven. Only through him do we even have a hope and a life and peace and even contentment in this life. And if that means we have to give up some luxuries, give up some, some personal pursuits, because we have to form our schedule around being with him, then so be it. Peter remind, told Jesus, we gave up everything, and certainly they did. They gave, up their, they gave up their jobs, they gave up being with their families all the time. They gave it all up. And, and we too will have to give up something. We already have. By being here, we've already given up something else we could be doing. And God's promise to you is, yes, what you may have given up might have hurt, might be a sacrifice. But because you are connected to me, not only will you be blessed more than you can imagine in this lifetime, but you have what's even most important. You have eternal life. And so you have something to look forward to in the life to come. So what's the answer to the question? What must I do to be saved? The answer is simple, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because Jesus has already done it all for you. Amen. Please rise.